Uh, my name is Mike Gayhard. I work at Pivotal. And I am here to tell you a little story about a monolith to microservices evolution that I did uh, end of last year. Um, so about me, I work as a labs engineer. So I'm helping clients kind of take their big, messy monoliths, get them onto the platform, and eventually end up in microservices. Um, I also have worked on the Spring Cloud Services team. So anybody that's seen those guys talk about Eureka and Hystrix and all that stuff, I helped that team for eight months. I figured no better way to learn about microservices than work on the team that is building the tools for microservices. Uh, and I'm also trying not to be a chief principal senior consultant scientist. As a consultant, you tend to run into the, hey, you're selling me some stuff. Um, what I want this talk to be is a very real talk about microservices. So microservices have a buzz right now. They have their own marketing department. It's kind of like Docker containers. Um, so what I want to do here is, is kind of give you information and not try to convince you that this is a good way. I want you to have enough information to make your own decision. So how many people are, have a monolith that need, needs migrating? Keep your hands up, please. How many of you are actively migrating a monolith? All right, keep them up, keep them up. How many people are building microservices net new? What are the rest of you all working on? Because you don't fall into one of those three categories. What is there? Building what? Building, building a monolith. But it probably needs migrating at some point. Yeah, many, monoliths. many monoliths, okay. Um, so I'm hoping that this talk will have a little bit of everything for everybody. My goal is for you to show up at work on either Friday or Monday whenever you go back and be like, oh yeah, I saw this talk at Spring One Platform. And I'm gonna try this one thing in my code base. So that's my goal. You all have to let me know how I do. Um, so we're gonna talk about where these ideas come from. Which one comes first? I have my opinions on which comes first, monolith or microservices. Your opinions may vary, that is fine. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a concrete path, starting with a train rack of a monolith all the way to a set of microservices. So a little background. Uh, this whole discussion started with this guy. His name's Mike Baranek. He used to be our office director in Boulder. He works at Pivotal. He came up with this idea of an app continuum. So this is really cool. Um, depending on how much you know about your system and how much code you have, you start somewhere on this continuum. So it is not an either or, it is a yes and. If you've got 10 lines of code, you're probably over here somewhere. You know, you've got 100, maybe you're moving this direction. You start to get bigger, you're over here, you've got some applications and some libraries, and eventually you've got the green boxes, which is the services, congratulations, you now have a distributed system. About six months ago, I found this guy. Anybody heard of Simon Brown? You should all read his stuff. He came up with the same idea. It's called a modular monolith. So if I build a code base that is well structured to begin with, when I go to microservices, all I do is take that apart. With a well-structured monolith, I get a bunch of really cool things. So I get all of these benefits. And when I go to a set of microservices, I get all of those as well. If you don't need all of these, you can stay here for a while. So this whole talk is based on this idea of if I build a monolith in a certain way, that monolith may have a longer lifespan than I would like to believe it had if it wasn't organized this way. Any similarities? What do these two ideas have in common? So if I go back here and I look at this one, but as I move down this thing, I get just more structure in my code base. I've got libraries, I've got some applications, I've got some microservices, which is another layer of structure in my system. If I come in here, I've got these little circles with a box around them. So I'm just adding structure to my application. The more structure I have in my application, the better off it is going to be longer term for me. That's the hypothesis anyway. Anybody sitting there like, yeah, we were doing this 15 years ago. Single responsibility principle, all that stuff. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time. What we haven't been doing for a long time is actually doing it. We've also been doing it subtly wrong, which we'll talk about um, when we get to further into the slides, but this is not like brand new information that I just came up with. This has been around for a long time. Okay, so which comes first? I am going to start with a quote from Kent Beck, one of my favorite people on the internet. It depends. So if you've got water or a drink, there's a little drinking game you can play with this talk. Every time I say it depends, you take a drink. Awesome. Um, 
So I love this quote, I have two engineering degrees. There's a lot that we don't understand about microservices. There's a lot that is very specific to our situations. So if you're looking for like the five steps to a microservice nirvana, this talk is probably not for you. Um, it's more like the 10 steps to maybe getting to Microsoft Nirvana, depending on kind of where you stand. So monolith or microservice, everybody drink. It really depends. If we go back to the app continuum, as I said earlier, the further this direction I am, so the further I'm down here to this structure, I know more about my system at that point. Because if I'm a startup, and I have no idea what my business model is, and I begin to build microservices, that's probably not a great idea. But if I'm a bank, and I've been doing banking for the same way for 25 years, and I don't forecast that changing for the next 25 years, I might start way down here, because I have a general idea of what my application is doing. Same thing here. So you've got this whole idea of well-structured. This is my favorite quote. Thank you. Usually gets a bigger laugh. Really, let's be honest with ourselves. If we can't take one code base and make it look good so we can actually work in it for a long period of time, what makes us think that we're just magically birth microservices into the world and have those things actually be well-structured? The worst thing you can do for yourself is build what I call a distributed monolith. And if we got a microservices architecture that's really chatty and you're doing distributed transactions across different microservices, you now have a distributed monolith. Congratulations, you have the worst of all worlds. So this is my hypothesis, a well-structured monolith. And when I guess why I start with a well-structured monolith? It's simple, yes. Simple is always a good answer. Do you always do the simplest thing that could work? Anything else? Joe? Create good patterns. Good patterns. Um, really, because I don't trust myself to do this right the first time. I want a code base that I can experiment in very easily. If I have a monolith, it's a lot easier to push files around inside of one code base. If I've got 12 microservices and I need to push some files around, I'm lucky if they're all in the same repository. I probably have 12 different repositories that I'm pushing files around in. So the more I know and the more stable my code base is, the more likely I am to be able to go to a good set of microservices. If I've got, mo I'm still moving boundaries around, I'm still trying to figure out like where does the user boundary live, I probably want to stay in a monolith. So that's why I do it, just so I don't have to think about that. I can be like, oh, I can make a bunch of mistakes and those mistakes are reversible in this monolith. So I talk about these boundaries, this structure. And the key is, is this idea called bounded context. Do you know what bounded contexts are? Can we fathom a guess? Anybody read either of these two books? So this one, Eric Evans, 2003. The problem is with Eric Evans' book, he puts the idea of bounded context way at the back of the book. <clears throat> so by the time you get there, you've like, you're just like your head is spinning with all these new ideas. <clears throat> I like the Vaughn Vernon book because he talks about bounded context up front. What a bounded context is, is a business concept in my app. So if I'm building a shipping piece of software, I probably have shipments and I probably have users and I probably have packages. Those might be my bounded context. And these are things in the domain, not architectural things. And this is where SOA went wrong. So we got like an enterprise service bus they're dealing with right now. Anybody? Raise your hand, we won't judge. How much you like that? Yeah, that's what I thought. What happened was is we made, we put a lot of this logic in the service bus, into the infrastructure, which makes it really hard to separate things because now we have coupling to the infrastructure. This idea of a bounded context says I make all of my stuff in a box and I make the pipes super dumb. HTTP is a pretty dumb protocol. <clears throat> so they've been talking about this for years. That Eric Evans book was written in 2003. It's not a new concept. It's just really hard to get right because it depends on your bounded context and it's a lot of experimentation to get the boundaries right. So how do you get there? What better way to get there than try this out on a client project? Yeah, it was fun. So we did a POC for a client in Colorado, um, big telecommunications company. Uh, they, you know, Netflix was getting ready to eat their lunch. Hulu was, you know, close behind, and they were feeling some pressure. So they came to us, they wanted to, they had a product, but it, it wasn't scalable, it was a big Rails app, it was kind of a mess. 
as tends to happen with ghost code bases. So their goals were to migrate this thing that was making money to a more sustainable solution for the future. They weren't worried about business model at this point because Netflix and Hulu had proven out that this was a viable business model. Selling internet, you know, using the internet to get my TV shows was a viable business model. So they weren't worried about trying to figure this out. But it had to be sustainable because they wanted to make money off of this. They knew they, knew that. they, knew they needed scalability. As Netflix has proven, these apps tend to have to scale. You have lots of users, and that's how you make more money is you just scale the app. They knew they were going to need multiple teams. They had a POC. It was running in production. They kind of knew how big this thing was. So they wanted to be able to have multiple teams working in the code base. And they also wanted to scale the resources up and down. So you wanted to add people for a couple of weeks to get a bump in velocity. And then they wanted to take those people off. And they wanted enough room in the swimming pool for everybody without affecting the other teams. So these were the goals of the project. The current state was a set of API servers. So as you can imagine, shipping JSON all over the world. Multiple clients. So this was a, an Xbox, set-top boxes, you know, iPhones, iPads, all that fun stuff, plus JavaScript front end. This was a fun one. The number was somewhere between 0 and 100%. Uh, really, the estimate was probably 25 or 30%. They inherited this code base from a company they had bought. Um, they had not taken the dead code out, so we didn't know kind of what they were using at this point in time. We could do some analysis on traffic and stuff like that. Couple this one with that one, and it made us pretty sad. So. Uh, they just didn't have a set of API tests. Literally, they were running this thing in production, and nobody knew what kind of how to test this thing. Yes, production was the way we tested it. So it was scary because we were in production making money. They've already had they already had one outage that cost them a quite a bit of money. So they were risk averse to actually breaking changes because it had already happened once at a very bad point in time. So it made us sad. So maybe got to guess where we start. So I work at Pivotal. One of the things we do is, starts with a T. Hmm? Transform, yes. TDD. So we ended up here. We felt like we were walking on tightrope, so we wanted to write some tests. Why did we write API level tests? Why did we not care about unit testing at this point? I don't know what code is good. I'm going to break this thing up anyway, so writing unit tests wasn't great. So if your current state looks like this, and your future state looks like that, what stayed the same? So that's the first state. That's the second state. It's the interface. So the box on the outside, this box, stays the same. All we're doing is smashing that thing into multiple pieces. So we wrote our tests just like that. So we simply stood the app up and just wrote these API tests. Because what we wanted to do is make sure that nothing broke before we got to production. Obviously, you can go to production, but that's a little late. So we used a library called PACT. Have we used PACT before? Heard of consumer-driven contract tests? So what you do with consumer-driven contract tests is you define a JSON document that says, when I give you this JSON, you're going to respond with this stuff. What is the first thing you do when you're writing a JavaScript front end, if you're doing TDD? You write a little dummy server that just serves you up canned JSON responses, because you want to make sure that the, the thing can take JSON and render it. And what do you do when you're doing a back end? What's the first thing you write? A set of tests that say, hey, when I poke you with this JSON, you're going to ship me back a 200 and this other JSON. So these pack tests, oops, wrong way. These pack tests allow us to specify that contract in the middle and then auto generate both sides of that. So now the client code can run the tests in its test, test suite. The server side code can run the tests in it test, its test suite. And as long as the contract hasn't changed, everybody knows that they're adhering to the contract. If you change the contract, 
and you run the tests on the server side and those tests break, you now know that the server is no longer satisfying that contract to the client and you need to fix it. Because if you don't, when you go to production, the client's going to break. So there's a seam in there that you can write tests against, and they're great. You can do them in JSON, you can ship them around, everybody can use them. So the result here was we now had tests that would tell us before we go to production whether or not we had broken anything. Again, we were making money, it was running in production. It's like flying an airplane and pulling up another airplane next to it and just like shipping people over. If you don't do that with a safety net, you're gonna drop a couple, and that's always bad for business. So step number two. Just pushing the code around so I actually see what this thing does. Because I want to understand these bounded contexts. Because in a messy monolith, I have zero idea what my bounded contexts are most of the time. And this is the reason we have trouble breaking these things up, is because everything is tangled like this. If I have bounded context, now I can just ship those things different directions. Little pop quiz. If I would like to change something in the user domain, what is the maximum number of folders I may have to touch to make that change? It's greater than, greater than two, but less than four. It's three. This is also a Rails app. In this model, if I want to change something in the user's domain, how many, what is the maximum number of folders I will have to go into? One. Can you tell me the two bounded contexts in this, in this model really quickly? Orders and users. Is it easier to see in this one? This is the old way of doing it. These horizontal layers of architecture. So I have a controllers layer, I have a view layer, and I have a domain models layer, and in Rails, that's my database access. Oops. In this model, I have vertical slices through the system. I have a user slice. I have an order slice. I might have a packages slice. These are my bounded contexts. So I'm starting to add structure to my code base. But that structure is in service of bounded context. It is not in service of what layer of architecture I'm dealing with. So the goal, the outcomes, is I now have minimized the number of directories that I have to go play in. I've created a really thin wall between the user-bounded context and the order-bounded context. It's like that rice paper you see at Japanese restaurants. But it's now two rooms. I can now start to put more people in there. It is much less costly to experiment with and evolve bounded contexts. Because in this thing, I'm just shuffling them between directories at this point. I'm also delaying architecture decisions, which I like to do. I don't remember who said this. Do you remember who said this? Is it Uncle Bob? or Martin, it might have been Martin Fowler. But I'm just delaying those architecture decisions longer and longer and longer. So I have more and more information when I actually have to make those. Okay, step three. So I'm now simply gonna to begin to pull those bounded contexts slowly away from each other. I'm just gonna create some more space in the code base and make the, so I'm gonna go from rice paper to like drywall at this point. So here's my application. I have an applications directory. In that applications directory, so this is a Java Spring code base. I have a build.gradle file. And I have my controller and my application. I also have a components directory. It has a billing component that has a build.gradle file. And it begins to talk in my domain language. So my components are my domain, which is really all I care about, because that's what makes me money. And then here is my framework code. So here's my spring code. Here's you know, drop, drop wizard code. Pick a framework of your choice. I'm now starting to pull those things apart. So this is always a question that comes up. Where do the databases live? Anybody want to guess what my answer to this one is? It depends. So the application can manage those. You can also have the components manage those. Um, sometimes it works one better one way or the other. It really just depends. There is, though, one rule that I always live by with these, and that is it. Why do I allow migrations to only touch one database table? Because if I have database table A and database table B, I'm lucky if they go the same direction. 
but they might go like this. And if I have those migrations in the same file, when they go like this, now I have to split them up. If they're all in one file and table A goes that way, migration file goes A goes that way. Because when I go to microservices, that database table is going to go somewhere. And table B goes the other direction. So this is the one rule that I always live by with databases. Is when you're doing a migration, just change one table. I just explained to you why. <clears throat> So now step three is I'm moving, again, moving these things further and further away from each other. So I'm making more room for multiple teams. I can now have a user team. They just play in the user component directory and maybe one directory in a controller. And you don't have to worry about my changes breaking your changes. So I'm making more room for those folks. I'm creating these strict boundaries. So I'm removing my framework code from my domain layer code. I'm also moving closer to microservices. Because what is a microservice? It is a bounded context with either an HTTP interface or you know, a messaging interface or something like that. But I have a microservice. It's just not being served via HTTP. And you can stop here and get a lot of the benefits. And this is hard. In those monoliths you've got, you could spend eight months to a year getting to this point. It's just because you, you've got a mess on your hands. You don't have enough structure. You have to add it back into the code base. OK, so congratulations. You've gotten to that point. You now want to pro promote your first microservice. So one reason I might want to do that is I want to scale a bounded context. So your, you know, your Twitter and the tweet endpoint is just getting hammered by people because the Super Bowl is coming up. So I want to scale that bounded context independent of all of the other bounded contexts. In a monolith, I have to ship out more of um, all of them. But if I can extract that code base, I can now just ship that piece of code out to production. It happens much more quickly. I might want to deploy that bounded context more frequently. So there might be a part of my business that is iterating faster than the rest of my business. If I have to ship the monolith to production every time that, that business unit wants to iterate, that's going to be slow. Because you're going to be deploying more code. You know, who knows how long that takes. It's also risky because I'm deploying a lot more code into production. The less code I can promote, the less risky it is. There are many other reasons. This book covers, I think, 12 or 13 of them. This is my favorite book on microservices. I do not get a kickback from Sam every time I show this video. And I'm being told I have five minutes. Um, so why not extract a microservice? So the cost of the service might outweigh the benefits. You might have dysfunctional organizational patterns. So everybody's heard of Conway's law? You know, the system will reflect the communication patterns of the organization. Well, if you have dysfunctional organizational patterns, you go to microservices, it's just going to make that communication all the much harder. So this actually forces you to change your org at this point in time, because you cannot go any further if you stay in the old org structure. Uh, and many, many other reasons I won't cover here. I'm going to speed it up a little bit, because I am running behind. Um, so I go from this to this. So the gray box is a free running process. If I have components, what's the only thing I do? I just spin up another application. I take those controllers. I take that stuff and I put it in a new Spring Boot application. I take my jar file. I put it in there and I'm off and running. There's nothing to it. It's literally just putting, moving a jar file into another application. So congratulations, you now have a distributed system and all the pain and suffering that comes with that. Um, I now have this dependency. Where does the billing system live? Where does the email system live? I also have network communications, and the network will fail at some point, so I need to deal with that. These, these microservices don't come for free. That's what people don't tell you. Um, so what I want to do now is use service discovery to abstract over that problem of location. I'm going to solve a problem now. I now have two problems I need to solve. So I have this. Here's my service discovery. So Eureka, if you went to the Spring Cloud, if you've seen Spring Cloud services. So the billing service calls the service discovery service, comes back, and then it calls the email service. So I now have this third party that is managing the location and quantity of my services. 
I no longer have to hard code that stuff. You could hard code it, but now if you spin up a new instance, now I gotta push stuff to production. So they're more loosely coupled. You can, uh, everybody's like, oh yeah, now you got a whole bunch of other network calls. You can actually manage that here because it reduces the number of network calls, client-side load balancing. It's called ribbon in, open, in Netflix OSS. But now I have an additional application to monitor. So I now have two apps that add business value and a third one that adds zero business value. So 33% of my system is not adding business value anymore. So now I've got another cost. How do I prevent this problem? And so now I have a network in between, and the network will fail, or my Amazon instances will disappear, like that's going to happen. So I use a circuit breaker, so I build another app here. So you have the same pattern. But now I have another hop. Before I call the email service, I now have to ask the circuit breaker, is this thing even up and running? Because if it's not up and running, what's worth me calling that thing? It might be suffering too, it could be slow. And the last thing you want to do is hammer a slow service. So I have another call here to make sure that the email service call will succeed. But now I have four applications. So in this case, I have an increased resiliency of the system because the network's going to fail. But I prevented that from bringing the whole system down. I also have increased visibility of the health of the system with, with a circuit breaker pattern, typically you get a dashboard that shows you all of the circuits that are open or closed. So you can look at them like a CI monitor. Like, oh, that service is, is failing. I need to go look at that thing right now because I, I need to monitor that. But now I have an, an additional application. So I now have four applications, two of which add business value. This is where Cloud Foundry comes in handy because the cost of running those apps is a little less, but I still have that. So you are now the proud owner of a set of microservices. Your next steps, you've paid all the costs, now you just start breaking out more microservices. Because if I go to a third microservice, I have five applications, I don't need another service discovery server, I also don't need another circuit breaker server. So now I've paid all the upfront costs. That first microservice is the most expensive. Because I've created a boundary between my framework code and my domain, I can now easily switch out the communication patterns. Because if I want to go to RabbitMQ, what do I have to touch? What is the only thing I have to touch if I've done this? Something in that application folder. The domain doesn't care where it's getting its information from. That interface is stable. I just change up the mess to a message queue. Or I don't do anything. I can stay here and just continue to iterate on my code, continue to iterate on my business model until I'm like, oh sweet, I now have a benefit that outweighs all of the costs and I just do my next microservice. The choice is really up to you, which is I love, because again, it gives me the ability to delay those engineering decisions and do engineering analysis on what my next step is. It's not emotion driven, it's now I have costs, I have benefits, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Awesome, ship the next microservice. So there are two examples of this. This is the original one based on the POC from the client. I rewrote it in my spare time. I also have been writing Kotlin in my spare time. So if you wanna check out the Kotlin solution, I highly recommend checking out that repo. Any questions? Yes. Yep. Well, I don't have DAO code now. I have, a, I have a, a bounded context. It depends on what that table is doing. So if it's a join table, now I have to somehow deal with that join table differently because I, don't, I can't do joins in the database anymore. So students are over here and teachers are over here. I have to figure out what that table is doing for me and I have to figure out if it goes one direction or the other or if it simply just disappears and I now make when I'm in the students, if I, let's say I want to answer the question, what students belong to this teacher? I'm going to ship a teacher ID over to the student bounded context and simply do a select star where teacher ID does that. So I can't do database joins anymore because I now have microservices. I can't do that stuff. So there's a cost there and I have to be ready for that. Um, now if there's data on that table, so let's say I have a date added to class or something like that on that join table, now I have to figure out where that lives. 
And now you have to start asking questions of what, were you, what are we using that information for? Do we have to, to denormalize our database to get that information somewhere? I can't just get rid of it, but I can't do the joins through that table anymore. So you could replicate it. It, it, de it depends a lot on the query patterns that you're doing. What questions are you asking of that data? That's how, what drives out the data model. Yes? So in the uh, first card start, we talked about the goals of this particular client. Yep. Ha. And I would like you to address that. What would you like to, I mean, yes, cost. Well, well it was in there, and, and the re, I'm wondering if it wasn't really the high priority. But you know, it wasn't. The they knew that if they didn't do this project, they, their whole business was in trouble. So they were just like, yep, yeah, we're going to pay for this. We need to get this figured out. Yes, it's going to cost money, and we're just going to have to do it. I guess what I'm looking to get you to say. Uh, yeah, see, you're leading, it's a leading question. Cost savings can come from better agility. It depends. You want to ask yourself, why am I breaking out these microservices? Do I need to scale? Do I need to do X, Y, and Z? But you should know why you're doing it. And cost is probably very low down the line. It is not necessarily a driving factor. It is a benefit of some other thing that you're doing. Um, microservices do not save you money in the long run because you're building, you got more apps to run. So if you're not running on Cloud Foundry, now I have more Amazon instances to run, so it's going to cost you more money to run the microservices. That cost might be very much outweighed by the $6 million I'm making on the thing because I have better business agility, I can react to the market quickly, I can put more teams on it, I can scale faster, I can you know, not drop packets on the floor. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons you would do that. Any more? All right, cool. I'm going to wrap it up. I'll hang out for a little bit if you have questions. Um, thank you so much.